Now grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> In the Bible, we see God pictured in two very different ways. On the one hand, he's the God who says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, is that being that surrounds creation, that maintains creation, but isn't really in creation. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like he's kind of outside looking in and making sure everything works right. But then occasionally, and it's only occasionally to be honest, God becomes a character within the story. And there, it kind of happens again here and then here and then here and then here and then here. So let's look at what some of those then here's are. Abraham and his wife Sarah and their everybody that's a part of their group and their animals and everything are where they parked and settled at the Oaks of Mamre. Now we don't really know exactly where that was. Somewhere in what we would call the nation of Israel today. And they're there and they're resting and all of a sudden three people show up. Abram, he's still Abram at this point, rushes out to greet them, and then he goes to his wife and says, get three measures of choice flour and make cakes, and he goes to the, the head herder and says, slaughter the fatted calf and put it on the spit and barbecue it up. You know, barbecue's a big thing in the Bible. And then he invites his people to sit down and takes their ease and find one of his servants to bring a bowl of water and wash their feet. You think, why do people go around washing their feet all the time in the box? Well, if you've ever been in the desert, and some of you may not have been, it's hot, it's dusty, and it's sandy. And if you walk around in sandals all day, your feet get dirty and tired and sweaty. And so one of the things that a good host would do provide a basin of water and towel to wipe off people's feet and give them some relief. Now we all know by now, because we are all biblical scholars here, is that this is the prelim to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in just a few verses on is when Abram, you know, uh, trying to preserve Lot in his family's life, bargains with God over how many righteous people he can find and still not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. That's one place where God enters the story. Well, we go a couple of generations down and Moses, Abraham's descendant, is out leading his father-in-law sheep out into the wilderness there for them to graze for the day and he looks over and he sees this bush with fire splitting right up out of it, but nothing is burning up. And he goes over there, and he hears a voice saying, take your shoes off because this is holy ground. And he has a long conversation with God. At one point, God says, I'm going to send you back so you can lead the people of Israel out of slavery. And Moses looks right up and says, don't you mean the Moses that lives two valleys over? He's not really interested in going. God says no, and then he says, well, how will they know if I'm coming from you? What name can I give them? Because, you know, a name is an important thing. And in, in the Old Testament world, if you knew someone's name, that gave you some measure of power over them. And in some cultures, you had the name that was given to you for daily use, but wasn't your real name, your true name that your parents gave you. You kept as a closely guarded secret so that people could not have power over you. And of course, God answered by saying, tell them that I am has sent you. It's interesting. We don't get a noun, we get a verb. I am. We, that's part of the verb to be.
some few generations later, Elisha, Elijah, fearing for his life, leaves the kingdom of Israel and travels down into the Negev Desert to Mount Sinai and meets God, and God passes his back in front of him because if Elijah were to see his face, he would have died. Now we see Jesus, God, again, made visible, but in such a way that he is not a danger to us. God has a plan, and he's been working at it for a very long time. <clears throat> We can go back to the story of Noah and the ark where God, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it memorized exactly. He looks down and says, human beings are what they are. They're sinful from their birth. Nevertheless, I will not destroy the earth again with a flood, and I will endure with them. Endure with them. God sets to work process of the salvation of people. Not just some people, but all people. And there's Abram who becomes Abraham. And there's Noah, not Noah, Moses. And there's King David. And on down the line until finally there's Joseph and Mary and the baby. Jesus, among all the things that Jesus does, makes God visible. He's got hair growing on his head. He's got two eyes, one right here and there. He's got a nose and a mouth and ears, arms, hands, and fingers, legs and toes and everything else. He is just like us. Except that he's not. But you know. And one of the things that we need to remember is that there is nothing in the complete wholeness of God, which is what the word mystery was designed for. And you know, most of y'all think mystery, that's that's a TV show where it starts out and somebody gets killed and you find out who killed them at the end, and that's mystery. But I'm using mystery in a more technical sense. The mystery means we can say a whole lot about something, but we can't ever say everything. So we can know a whole lot about who God is and how God acts and what God is, but we never get to all of it. But there is this truth that Jesus makes plain for us. There is nothing in the whole mystery of who God is that contradicts anything that we see in the person of Jesus. There's nothing back there that would be different. It would contradict it and say, no, Jesus got it wrong. Everything we need to absolutely know about God is in the man Jesus. Who we celebrate, whose birth we celebrate at this time of year who comes to us as a baby just like all of us. And to have a nurse for his mother to get nutrition and to have diapers. We don't often think about little things like that, but he did. You know, he had to learn to walk, had to learn to read and write and feed himself, just like every other human child in the world has to learn. You know, sometimes I, I, I look back on when my son was like that, and I think in those first four years of life, how much do children learn? It's just incredible. They learn to crawl, they learn to walk, they learn to talk, learn to control their bowels and such, learn to feed themselves. Sometimes by four they can dress themselves, maybe not always, 
that we don't expect the young men at that age to be able to tie high. That comes to a little bit later. But Jesus is just like us. He has to learn all of those things and how to do. And, as is often the case with those who follow God, in his young years, his life is filled with threats, death. Herod, the Herod that we're talking about, now Herod the Great, um, was somebody who was in deathly fear of being overthrown, of being killed. Uh, he actually killed, had murdered several of his sons who we thought were plotting against him to have him murdered and take over his throne. This was not the kind of family you want to grow up in. And when the wise men had come to him asking, where can we find he who is born king of the Jews? Herod's mind goes, uh huh, here's another threat. And so, you know, sort of like, you know, when you do see that smile, you know, when people smile, smile so nice, the butter would melt in their mouth, and you know, there's a knife sticking in your back right quick. He tells them, please go and find him, and when you do come back and tell me so that I might go and worship him. Why did all what he had in mind? When the wise men are what are warned and ready for God to go home another way, and Herod sends his soldiers in there to kill every child two years old and younger, because based on the time that the wise men say they've been on the road headed this way, that child could have been two years old. We don't know. We don't. But could be. He could be a new one. And they may have started before Mary ever got pregnant. We don't know. But we know that there is a threat to Jesus' life. And the angel warns Joseph to get his family up in the middle of the night and head out towards Egypt, which they do, and that that saves their lives. And after Herod dies, his territory is split up between four of his sons. And Joseph receives a dream saying it's safe to bring your child back to grow up among his people. And they come back. But the one who's got Herod's throne in Jerusalem, they don't trust at all, so they go to Nazareth. Where we'll find the Herod that we read about in Jesus' crucifixion. God, through the scope of the Bible, has made himself known in a personal way over and over and over again. And here in Jesus is that last personal way, the most personal way. He comes in flesh to live like one of us. He takes human death and makes it a part of the life of God. Because everything that Jesus experiences here on earth becomes a part of God's life. And he does this. God does this. So that through Jesus' life, death, suffering, can be that one who saves us from ourselves. In this season of Christmas, we celebrate the birth of But we know our eyes are fixed now on Easter. Makes all the difference in the world for all of us.